The comedian John Oliver once said that Bitcoin is everything people don't understand about money combined with everything they don't understand about computers. Now, this may not be true for everyone, but he has a point. Most people don't know exactly what money is. Yes, they use it every day, but they do not necessarily care about its history, its functions, and the various design patterns. But no matter whether you care about it or not, monetary systems are the foundation of the world economy, and monetary policy affects everyone. Moreover, the Bitcoin white paper describes Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic version of cash. So it is probably a good idea for any cryptocurrencies and blockchain course to start with an introduction to money, or more precisely, monetary theory. Okay, before we get started and really can understand what money actually means and what it does, we have to look at an economy where there is no money, where, where no money exists. And if, if you think about such a hypothetical economy, then people there really have two options. Um, they could either uh, just produce everything themselves, so be completely self-sufficient, that's option one. And uh, when you look around yourself and look around your room, and I, I, I don't know where you are currently, but I assume there is a lot of stuff on your left and on your right, then you probably can imagine that this isn't really an option, at least not in an economy like the one we're used to today. Uh, producing everything on your own, and being completely self-sufficient, would mean that you have to completely cut back on your on your lifestyle and that you really couldn't can just get everything you wanted like we, we can do right now. So that seems to be, well, for some people it may be an option, but for most people it's it's not really an option because you have to kind of cut back on your lifestyle. Uh, and the other one would be trade. And that's essentially the backbone of our entire economic model. That's essentially the backbone of our economy and uh, how everything is conducted. So people specialize, they produce just something, something they're really good at, something they can heavily specialize on, and then they start to trade. And that's exactly what we had in the beginning. Mm, you look at, for example, this, this simplification with our doodles right here, and I hope you enjoy them because you better get used to them. We will use them a lot throughout this class. I, I like these, these doodles. Um, and we have a, a blacksmith on the left right here, and this blacksmith produces horseshoes, and uh, you have a saddler right here, and this saddler produces saddles, obviously. And in the best case scenario for the two, they can really just trade. So let's, let's assume that this blacksmith right here um, is in, in desperate need for saddles. And on the other hand, the saddler right here uh, wants these horseshoes. Then the blacksmith and the saddler, they just exchange these goods and everything is fine. And that's perfect. Now, the thing is, as you will see later on, uh, usually it's not that easy. Usually mm, you, you cannot just find someone who is... is has exactly what you need and is looking for exactly what you have. And as you will see, that's the double coincidence of once, and we will talk about that a lot later on. And even more complicated, I mean, you have to value these these objects, these goods somehow. You have to come up with a common scale that you know how many saddles you get for a, for a horseshoe and the other way around. And there are just all of these ratios, all of these relations. And then last but not least, uh, you have to store wealth somehow. Uh, this this wouldn't be a big problem for the saddler and the blacksmith because their goods are not perishable, so they could simply produce and store them if they cannot sell them immediately or trade them immediately. But when you think about, let's go with a dairy farmer as an example, then uh, then this guy has perishable goods, and it's not that easy to store wealth for him or her. Uh, in this case, uh, she would have to sell everything immediately uh, for other goods and then store these goods and then she would have to assume that these goods can be traded. So it gets really cumbersome and, and mm, really complicated when you're living in a barter economy like that. And the economist refer to that as the search and matching cost, which are part of the transaction cost. So a long story short, when you're uh, engaging in trade and you have... Uh, significant significant costs just to find the other guy or the other gal uh, who want to trade with you, then that's probably not a good system. And uh, yeah, that's exactly essentially what money solves. Uh, it's three functions for each monetary unit. So the first one I've already mentioned it is the medium of exchange, which allows more efficient trade and uh, an optimized allocation of goods and services, as you can see here. Um, then you have the unit of account, and the unit of account really is just a universal reference price. So when you, um, let's say we have a, a unit of account, of a, that's, that will actually be the, the example we use later on, of a potato. 
uh, then you could just express all prices in potatoes and you would have this common reference point. And then last but not least, as I've mentioned, the store of value, which is also a monetary base function and a function of money. And that's really for saving. So when you want to save something, when you want to uh, smoothen your consumption over time, when you want to store your wealth for a later period, um, then you can also use money and you cannot do that with most of the other goods. So, I mean, in most economies, you really have a uh, medium of exchange by decree. So there is some uh, government agency or usually a central bank. And it's really in, in this country's law that some object, some uh, monetary unit is used as legal tender and then it becomes the dominant medium of exchange. But there is the theory by Karl Menger um, who stated that in fact, a good which is generally accepted, so widely accepted, that everyone has a need for, could emerge as a dominant medium of exchange without any intervention whatsoever. So for example, when you have an economy where everyone is looking for potatoes, because everyone likes potatoes, they have use for it, uh, then first of all, they can consume it. So there is already a, a, a base valuation for it, as you will see in intrinsic value later on. But more importantly, when they can reasonably assume that everyone else will also accept these potatoes for payment, then these potatoes may become a dominant medium of exchange. And a dominant medium of exchange means that you can trade it against pretty much anything. Um, so in our example right here, when somebody wants a, a, a horseshoe, then this person is paying with potatoes. Uh, here again, horseshoe potatoes, but also saddle potatoes. So no matter what you're looking for in this economy, you can always settle your debt with potatoes with this immediate settlement and you just pay right away. So in some sense, potatoes in this economy would really be the, the dominant currency, the dominant medium of exchange. Now let's look at it a little more formally uh, in, a, in a very small and simple and simplified uh, game theoretical model. Let us assume that there is a, a probability uh, lowercase pi, that I will accept the good as a medium of exchange. And uh, this depends on my expectations that everyone else, all the other agents in this economy will also accept it, which is uppercase pi. So lowercase pi is the probability that I accept it. Uppercase pi is the probability that everyone else, the other agents accept it, or rather my expectations of that. Of course, there are uh, some assumptions since lowercase pi and uppercase pi uh, probabilities it shouldn't be a surprise that they have between have to be between zero and one so right here and right here that's one condition and here the u as always in economics is for utility so that's basically your utility function uh, u of lowercase pi which means uh, it depends on your choice of lowercase pi it depends on your acceptance probability and what this term here says is that the um, whenever you, when you have a given acceptance probability, let's say you're accepting it with, with 0.5, that is the probability that you accept this good as a payment. And then whenever the overall, the general probability, so the, the probability that everyone else accepts it increases, then your utility will increase. Okay, that's the basic idea. And this is true for all lowercase pi greater than zero. Of course, when you're not accepting the good at all, then it doesn't really matter what the other guys are doing. Uh, you will not get any utility from it. That That is why uh, zero is excluded. Okay, so let's look at that. And again, you can see the doodles, uh, so that we don't just have math, uh, that this gets a little easier to understand. Uh, the acceptance of money uh, is in essence, a coordination game. And I assume that most of you already had game theory or similar classes. So this should be quite familiar to you. Now let's look at the first case. And the first case is quite easy. Uh, when you accept, when, when you expect that everyone else will not accept, uh, which is here depicted by the uh, uppercase pi equals zero, what are you gonna do? I mean, uh, would you accept something that no one else will accept later on? Would you accept a piece of paper as a as a <laughs> as payment when you know from with certainty that no one later on will accept it? Uh, most likely not. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, you would have to hold on to it. You pay for it, but then you cannot get rid of it. You cannot buy anything for it. So obviously, your best strategy in this case 
uh, would be zero as well. So whenever you expect that no one else will accept it, which is zero acceptance probability, you will also choose zero. And then we are really here in this graph, uh, as you can see right here on the X axis, that's the probability that everyone else will accept. And right here on the Y axis, uh, that's your acceptance probability. Mm, your best response, as I mentioned, when, when you expect that no one else will accept it, so we are really on the zero on the x-axis, and your best response would be not to accept it either, which would be zero on the y-axis right here. Okay, So you would end up here in equilibrium C, and as we will see later on, that's really an equilibrium, a stable one. So let us assume that everyone else will accept with certainty, and again, you can see these nice doodles right here. Uh, they have open arms, so they will accept your medium of exchange. Uh, a little more math heavy, you can see it right here. If your assumption is, if your expectation is that everyone else will accept it, so uppercase pi equals one, what are you going to choose? Obviously, when you know we can get rid of it with certainty, um, your best strategy is lowercase pi equal one, so you will be in this equilibrium A, um, given the assumption we have stated earlier. By the way, we didn't explicitly model the utility function. You can do that as an exercise on your own if you want to do it. Uh, the assumptions are sufficient, first of all, and second, I, I do assume that most of you already have seen these games, uh, so we're going to take this shortcut. And then last but not least, of course, there is everything in between. So um, let us define uh, this threshold value, which is uppercase pi hat. And uppercase pi hat really means um, if the uppercase pi value is larger than uppercase pi hat, um, this has to be her larger zero as well, um, then I will choose lowercase pi one. So what's that, what does this mean? When you think about it right here, you have this value, uppercase pi hat, it's a threshold value. Uh, whenever the overall acceptance rate by everything else is above this threshold value, then your best response right here is accepted as well, okay? So that's the basic idea. Whenever the um, whenever the overall acceptance rate, uppercase pi, is below this threshold value, uppercase pi hat, then your best response would be not to accept. That would be everything right here. So whenever it's below this threshold value, uh, then your acceptance rate would be at zero, as you can see here by the uh, red line uh, when, you, when you compare to the y-axis. Okay, that's the idea. And of course, there would be another equilibrium since um, basically you are, you can model everyone in this economy just as an agent as we did with this one. Uh, there would be a, another so-called mixed strategy equilibrium, Nash equilibrium right here with point B. However, this one is not stable. And why do I say that? Why is it not stable? I mean, when we're right here at the threshold value uppercase pi hat, um, then you're basically indifferent. You could choose anything in between. It doesn't really matter to you if your lowercase pi is set at zero or one or anything in between. Your utility would always be the same. That's why we see here this uh, vertical line right here. This symbolizes that you're indifferent. But once you move away just a little bit, what does it mean? Once you move away, let's, let's say, uh, you're not in B anymore, but you're accepting it with a little higher probability, then this would also impact the overall probability, uppercase pi. Why? Because you as an agent, you're also part of this group. And when you're part of this group, any decision you take will also influence the overall probability. Now, once we adjust the overall probability, you will move away from this threshold value, uppercase pi, hat. And let's assume again that you're accepting it with a little higher probability. What would it do? You would move a little bit to the right. And when you move it a little bit to the right, then you would be above this threshold value and it would really be self-reinforcing forces in place. And essentially, whenever you above this threshold value, you will end up in this monetary equilibrium. So where everyone will accept this good, whenever you're slightly below you will end up in this non-acceptance equilibrium, point C, where no one will accept this good. So yes, 
hypothetically speaking, in the model, there is something in between. Mm, it's not stable, so you have to be exactly in this spot. But the two really important equilibria right here, and these are self-reinforcing, are A, the monetary one, and C, the non-acceptance one. And intuitively, this makes a lot of sense. If everyone else is accepting it, or when you, when you have a, um, a reasonable right to assume that a lot of other people will accept this medium of exchange, then your best strategy, liquidity-wise, is also to accept it. Okay? If you know that you can pay with, with these potatoes or with whatever our dominant medium of exchange is, pretty much anywhere, then of course you will accept it because you know it will make your trading significantly easier. On the other hand, when you have to assume that no one else is accepting it or that you will have a really hard time finding places that accept it, uh, then you might be much more reluctant and obviously these forces are self-reinforcing. Good, so uh, we quickly talked about the double coincidence of once. And the idea is when you want to trade something, so let's say you have a, a um, you have apples, you're an, you're an apple farmer and you want bread. Then you have really two separated problems, okay? First of all, you need to find someone who has bread and is willing to trade, okay? So they, they have to have it in order to be able to give it to you. Second, they also have to be looking for apples. Only if both of these conditions are satisfied, so when they have bread and are willing to trade it, and when they are looking for apples, both of them, only then you will be able to trade. So in other words, when there are two agents and they want to trade, then it will only work out if agent A has what agent B wants to have, and agent B has what agent A wants to have, and they're both, both willing to trade. Uh, it uh, against it. So, okay, it's really two problems and that's the idea. And what does this mean mathematically? Um, when you have a really simple economy and it's a, a really simple model economy we have right here with just four goods. So we have bread, we have meat, we have apples and we have potatoes. Mm, then you would have one, two, three, four, five, six combinations, six trading pairs. Uh, obviously, the darker ones, we're not counting them right here because that would really be bread against bread, meat against meat, apples against apples, and potatoes against potatoes. And if we would count the white ones, that's, that's really double counting because it's the same trading pairs again, just the other way around. Okay? And that's quite a lot already. The thing is, it increases quadratically. It's really a quadratic function. So when you formalize it mathematically, you can formalize it by n squared minus n divided by 2. And that's n times n minus 1 and everything divided by 2, okay? That's exactly, I mean, you can derive that quite easily just by, by looking at this table here again and considering everything I've just said, that you obviously are not, you're not counting the ones uh, where you're trading the same goods against each other and you're not double counting and then you're essentially ending up with this equation with this function right here. Now that's in an economy in a barter economy where you have no money, no dominant medium of exchange, where you're just bartering, where people are trading these things against uh, each other. When you have a dominant medium of exchange, and in our case, as I mentioned, that's potatoes, then things are completely different. You can reduce the function to n minus one. Why? Um, because you have n goods, you have bread, meat, apples, potatoes, but since everything is traded against these potatoes, since you were just got rid of this double coincidence of ones. You just have three trading pairs. That is potatoes against bread, potatoes against meat, and potatoes against apple. And it's easy, it's as easy as that. So how does this look like? Uh, you have, when you have an economy with money, um, then it grows linearly. Here on the x-axis, once again, you have the number of goods and services. And here on the y-axis, you have the possible pairs of trading goods. And as I mentioned here in mint green, that's, that's the uh, um, relationship in a monetary economy. So when you have a dominant medium of exchange, and obviously this increases linearly. Why? When you go back to the equation, we have n minus one right here. So it's obviously a linear increase. On the other hand, when you have a pure barter economy, so no dominant medium of, ex medium of exchange, 
um, then it's a little different. Then it grows quite quadratically, as you can see right here. So the distance between the two gets larger and larger and larger. Why does it grow quadrat quadratically? Well, simply look at the function right here, and then it should be clear. Um, it's a quadratic function. Okay. So this means the larger the economy, the more goods and services there are, the bigger the difference between two, these two economies. And again, intuitively, this also makes sense when you have an economy with millions of goods and services, then bottle surely is not an option. Then you don't want to go out there and say, hey, uh, I have a kitchen table and I'm looking for a football jersey. Uh, it would be really hard to find someone who is willing to trade in this case. Okay. So some examples of dominant media of exchange uh, are, for example, the millstones or the, the raystones of Yup. Um, we will talk about that later on, but just to give you a quick teaser, Yup is an island and uh, essentially what these islanders did there, they used huge millstones, so huge stones as a currency. That was the dominant medium of exchange on this island. And yeah, it, 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 it's, questionable in terms of efficiency when you look at it, but it's a really interesting uh, story. And as you will see later on in this class, um, in fact, the YUP system has a lot in common with Bitcoin, with the Bitcoin system. Mm, and uh, we will obviously tackle that in the, in the course of this class. So the next example are shells. Uh, they've been used in, in Africa, for example, um, also in, in, uh, in uh, Guinea, for example, then you have some, some dominant media of exchange that only work in uh, subcultures or in closed ecosystems, for example, cigarettes and prisons, you have jewelry, you have metal money, and then of course the currency, and by currency here, uh, I simply mean our fiat currency, our legal tender, so coins and bills we are used to today. And all of these and many more are have at one point been or currently are dominant medium of exchange. And uh, that's really that's uh, really just to give you some examples and the feeling and an understanding that there is a large variety in things that have been accepted throughout history. So the second function, as I mentioned earlier, is the unit of account function. And if you have understood the medium of exchange, um, the the formalization, the mathematical, then this is really easy as well. It's exactly the same thing. In this case, we're not looking at a double coincidence of wants and uh, the problem that people have to look for a trade partner. This time we talk about measuring prices. Uh, and you think about it when you don't have a dominant medium of exchange, when you don't have some form of a monetary unit, mm, then when you want to express prices, you always, have, you always have to ask, okay, what are you paying in? What are you offering? And then you need to have some understanding of what the what the other object is worth in relation to everything else. Okay? So you really have all of these relationships. And then you have to know that, for example, here you have a, a one to eight relationship between uh, meat and bread, or a, a one to two relationship between apples and bread, or a one to four relationship between potatoes and bread, and so on. Okay? You have all these relationships. And that's really cumbersome. That's really not a good way to express prices and doesn't make too much sense. And again, it adds a lot to the transaction cost. So once again, it would be much easier when you just have a, a dominant monetary unit where all the prices can be expressed in. So that immediately when you're selling or buying something, you just express that price in this, in this monetary unit, in this dominant monetary unit. In our, in our case, potatoes, so you know immediately the bread is 0.25 potatoes, meat is 2 potatoes, and the apple is 0.5 potatoes, and so on, as an example, okay? And this makes things just much easier. It's much easier that way when you can measure everything in a common unit of account. And then last but not least, the store of value, which leads to the question, why do people save? What's the idea behind saving? And it's really two motivations. Number one, uh, utility functions usually are uh, concave. We have a diminishing return, diminishing marginal return uh, on, on your consumption, pretty much on everything. That's best explained when you think about a cake. So if you have, let's say, 10 cakes right now, um, I would make the argument that uh, the first piece you will probably highly enjoy in case you like cake. The second one, well, maybe two. 
But once you have eaten your first cake, the entire first cake, then uh, the second one you will most likely not enjoy as much anymore. Okay? And uh, I would further make the argument that once you reach the fourth cake, you probably will not enjoy it at all anymore. <laughs> so clearly for everything, and that is not just true for, for a cake, that's uh, true for pretty much anything, there is a diminishing marginal return. So that is usually measured in time units. I mean, uh, yes, you will not like you, you will not like to eat ten cakes right now, but maybe you want one today, and then one in a month, and another one in a month, in two months, and so on. Okay, so it's really we are talking about these time periods, these time intervals, and saving essentially allows you to smoothen your consumption over time. That's the entire idea. So let's say you have a huge income right now, but not necessarily, you're not sure if you, if you will have the same income later on, uh, then saving using a store of value allows you to move some of your consumption rights, to move some of your purchasing power in time uh, to a later period. That's the idea. The second idea is whenever you're looking for something that is really expensive. So this could be a place to live in, like a house or an apartment, or maybe something you use for production that is really expensive. Um, so I don't know, uh, when you buy equipment uh, for a lecture and you, you need all of these expensive microphones and cameras, then you have to save first, okay? That's, that's the idea. And if you cannot save, then people may not be able to buy these productive machines, to buy these productive tools and these goods. Um, so, yeah, if you cannot save, then uh, if I couldn't save, I couldn't buy the microphone or the camera or uh, things I can really use in, in producing this lecture, these, these lectures. And this is true for pretty much anything. If you're in, in, in the industry, if you're, if you're fabricating, fabricating something, if you're producing something, uh, then you need some machinery. And you can only buy that if you have the ability to save first. But the thing is, with saving, much can go wrong. I mean, in, in, in general, the, the idea is that the monetary unit would allow you to store this value and to save it and to store the purchasing power, as I've mentioned. But when you look at that, for example, here with the Argentinian peso or the Mexican peso or the Turkish lira, um, and you compare the purchasing power of the 1960s to the purchasing power today, then a lot went actually wrong. And that is... Um, not just true for for fiat currency. It could go with, with anything when, whenever there is a supply shock or anything like that. And the thing is, you have to be really certain when you're storing wealth in something that nothing goes wrong. And as you will see with fiat currency, this hasn't always been the case. Fiat currencies are currencies that are issued by central banks. They are a really great tool if they are managed nicely, if they are managed, um, if that you have a responsible central bank, if you have someone who Mm, who, who acts in a responsible manner, but it's a lot of power. And unfortunately, the history of fiat money, the history of central bank money has been, in many cases, a history of failures. Even when we're talking about the best ones, so these are really the best in class currencies, the US dollar, the Great British Pounds, the, the Swiss franc and Japanese yen. And, and there's a lot of survivorship bias because we we don't necessarily talk about the, the ones who failed really badly. But even when you're looking at these, and they are widely considered well-managed, they lost a lot of their purchasing power throughout, throughout the, the, the last decades. Um, now, what's really important, you, you cannot just look at these graphs and draw conclusions like that. You always have to think if there's something else, or there's some other effects, or there's some omitted forces that, that we didn't consider. And yes, there is one really important aspect that offsets some of this, what we're seeing right here, and that is interest rates. Obviously, the interest rates have been much higher um, in the 1960s. And if you're storing your wealth in these currencies for a long period of time, then this will offset since you will accumulate uh, interest. Mm, and of course, then uh, the purchasing power, the drop in purchasing power will all be offset to some extent. Um, it won't be offset completely, not even with these best in class currencies right here. Most certainly it will not be offset at all right here. I mean, this is really major crops when you look uh, at the at the scale of the y-axis right here. That's really bad. I just want to mention, I mean, you have to be really careful because some sources, they do not mention that. 
And uh, yes, of course, when you store your wealth, then you also earn interest. And that's important when you compare purchasing power uh, over time. So we have been talking about these functions. And in order to fulfill these functions, a monetary unit needs certain properties. And the first property is really storability. And storability means that something is well suited for a monetary unit if it is not perishable. So for example, apples, as you can see here on, on the image, or uh, even our example of potatoes, the one we used earlier, probably is not a, is not a, are not a good candidate or aren't good candidates for monetary units. I mean, you really don't want to have to worry about it. if something goes bad in your wallet, right? That would be would be really bad. And also in terms of the store of value, uh, you want to hold on to it for a long time, then the better is not perishable. The second one is the transferability. Uh, so the, the question is, how easily can you transfer something? How easily can you transact something? What are the transaction costs that are involved? Uh, is it cumbersome? These are, these are the basic questions. And one example, one we've used earlier are these yop stones so obviously when you have huge stones and you have to move them around then it's it's not a really good candidate for a monetary unit in terms of the transferability now as you will see in the course of the of this lecture actually of the of the next one or one of the next ones uh, these yop islanders they had a great idea the idea that they don't actually have to move these stones in order to increase this, tra this transferability. But just as a general rule, when you talk about monetary units, then they better are easily transferable uh, and uh, really inexpensive to do so. Next one is divisibility. This really tackles the, the question of whether you can something break down into fractions. Think of a gold bar as an example. When you, when you go to a um, a store, a grocery store, and you want to buy chewing gum, uh, then you obviously want, don't want to hand over an entire gold bar. That wouldn't make too much sense. Um, so you have to break it down, and that again creates transaction costs. So when, you're, when you have to start melting a gold bar in the store, that's probably not a good idea. So there are really two options. It could be either in really small denominations, so basically you have these small fractions, like really small coins, and then again it would be cumbersome when you want to buy something large, or you could have uh, the concept of, of ledgers. So really in, in electronic money, that's not a big issue because uh, there you can just have, um, basically define the numbers, uh, the number of, of uh, positions behind the comma, uh, and then basically you're all set. Um, long story short, something needs to be divisible in order to be well suited as a monetary unit. And if it's not divisible, then you might run into some issues. And then the fungibility, and fungibility really is the question of whether something is hom homogeneous, homogeneous. Um, when there are differences in quality, in, in, in things that can, you can have a subjective preference for, like color or just really some, some identification characteristic that um, creates some differences um, between the same, between instances of the same monetary unit, then you run into problems. So to, to give you an extreme example, when you would use cars <laughs> as a monetary unit, then uh, even if you ignore the various models that exist, even then you would run into issues because each car has its own mileage and its own condition. And uh, when you want to pay for something with a car, then the other party would have first to uh, check the condition and the mileage and all of these properties that are car specific. And that's not really efficient. As a monetary unit, you really want something that is, mm, that is, as I said, fungible, so homogenous, that doesn't differentiate there where there are no, no differences to all the other instances of the same monetary unit. Okay, that's the basic idea. And then the verifiability, um, of course, there shouldn't be any counterfeit thing, so it, it should be really easy and inexpensive to verify whether this is an actual monetary unit. And this actually goes along the next one, which is scarcity. If something is not scarce, if you can really cheaply produce it or just collect it somewhere um, in quasi uh, unlimited quantities, then it's it's not a good monetary unit. So something needs to be scarce in order for to qualify as a candidate for, for a monetary unit. And let's say sand as an example. Sand most likely is not a good example for a monetary unit uh, because it's readily available pretty much everywhere. Then last but not least, there should be a low price volatility. Um, things that may 
uh, may get go wrong right here. Uh, for example, seasonal fluctuations uh, when you have corn or wheat or anything. And then in some seasons there will be a really high supply, in other seasons there will be a really low supply, and that usually has an effect on prices, so it would have an effect on the purchasing power, on the relative scarcity in this economy, and these things are usually not a good choice for a monetary unit. And there needs to be um, some equilibrium between demand and supply. Um, in order to reach some sort of price stability. And one issue you could have, and we will actually see that in the context of Bitcoin, and that is one of the largest problems from my point of view Bitcoin has, is when you have a fixed supply, when you have a fixed cap, uh, you might run into some issues when you want to use this, this money as for, every, for everyday transactions. Um, on the other hand, as I mentioned, when you have seasonal fluctuations, so when you have cycles, this is also not a good idea. Uh, so um, ideally, ideally the supply would just adjust to the demand, but that's of course really hard to do. Uh, and also, uh, when you have someone who has the power to do so, then of course that's a huge centralization risk. So as you can see, there are pros and cons for everything. Uh, but one thing you should always consider with the properties of money is that there should be a relatively low price volatility as well. Good. Then the last thing we're going to tackle today is the monetary value. Uh, I want to show you the basic ingredients of the monetary value. So uh, there are three of them. The first one is the intrinsic value. And the intrinsic value really is the value of the good itself. So it's the question of when, it, when this good is not used as money at all, when no one else cares about it, what can I still do with it? Can I consume it? Can I use it in a production process? Uh, for example, is it a scarce, a scarce metal or anything like that? That's the so-called intrinsic value. That's when, when all the other demand goes away, when, when nobody cares about it except for myself, can I still do something with it? That's the basic question. The second monetary value component is the promise of payment. And that's really something that's art artificially attached. So for example, let's, let's assume we have a piece of paper. And this piece of paper, and yes, it has some intrinsic value, but it's negligible, it's really small because it's a piece of paper. But what if I write on there that you can give me that piece of paper in exchange for an ounce of gold? And I basically, I promise that whoever delivers this paper to me, this piece of paper, in exchange will receive an ounce of gold. Then it's a promise for payment, a promise, of pay, a promise for payment from myself. I promise some, someone that I will deliver this good. Uh, when I receive this paper slip, and yeah, that's that's really something I can do. That's really an additional mon monetary component. That's really an additional monetary value that you can attach to something. And many cases, it's actually much more valuable than the object itself, than the intrinsic value this object holds. And last but not least, it's the liquidity premium, and the liquidity premium really is the option to flexibly trade the monetary unit for an arbitrary good or service. So when you hold on to it, then you know that you can trade in exchange for pretty anything else, pretty much anything else. Um, so that's the premium that heavily relies on this on this good being a dominant medium of exchange, or at least of this good having a really high liquidity. That's the basic idea. Okay. And for economists, by the way, when we refer to bubbles. Uh, at least monetary economists, then that's exactly what we're talking about, the liquidity premium right here. Uh, when you don't have an intrinsic value, so the object itself isn't worth, any, worth anything or not much, you don't have a promise to payment or a promise for delivery, so nobody promises anything, um, then really all there is is this liquidity premium and that's the bubble. And economically speaking, that must not necessarily be something bad. But we have to be aware of it that this really de depends on the assumptions. This really depends on the expectations of these people. And as long as they have the expectation that they will be able to hand it over later on to someone else, everything is fine. But when these expectations break down, then nobody cares about this monetary unit anymore. Now, we can assign these characteristics to these three classes. So um, um, number one, we have the category of commodity money. Of some examples here, gold or um, uh, cigarettes or jewelry, and of course there is a the intrinsic value because you can you can use it. Um, 
And then there may be this premium, this liquidity premium, but what really is characteristic for commodity money is that most of the value actually gets from the intrinsic value. So there is a substantial part that is intrinsic. Then you have credit money and credit money really just has the promise and it may have a premium. Um, the um, the uh, most common example of credit money are so-called IOUs, IOU. So I owe you something, that's the idea, that's where it comes from, the IOU. And it's a promise for delivery. Uh, we can again go with the example I mentioned earlier where we have this paper slip where I write something on there that I will deliver something later on, like an ounce of gold. And that's credit money. And um, what's characteristic for credit money is that there is a lot of counterparty risk involved. When you think about it, when I make this promise, when I can deliver, when I'm able and willing to deliver later, uh, later on, when I have the reputation that I will do that, then this credit, credit money may trade at a certain price that is close to whatever the promise is. But when I have a reputation that I will not do that, or when, when you have, the, um, have to make the assumption that uh, I won't be able to do that, then the value may go close to zero. It may trade at a significant discount. So this is really dependent on the uh, reputation of the issuer. You have this counterparty issuer risk. That's really important to understand. The last category is fiat money. And fiat money means that there is really no intrinsic value. There is no promise attached. Uh, it's just the liquidity premium. That's all there is. Uh, so you don't have anyone who, who promises you something for delivery and the object itself is worthless. It's just it gets traded because people assume that other people will accept it later on, okay? And in fact, most of our currencies today, um, including the central bank currencies, are issued that way. So we are used to these fiat currencies and many people don't understand that. They, they, they still think that there is a promise behind that there is a promise for delivery, for example, for gold, but that simply is not the case. By the way, fiat currency, the term comes from fiat looks, which means there shall be light. Uh, and in this case, there shall be money. <laughs> so it really means that there, it is created from, from nothing that just, mm, there hasn't been anything before and somebody creates these fiat currencies and they get accepted and traded purely on base of the expectations of the economic agents. That's the basic idea. So I'm gonna say something highly controversial right now. And I don't wanna dive into that right now, but I'm just gonna drop it to get your attention. <laughs> Bitcoin is actually also part of this group. And I'm not saying that to disrespect it and uh, question the innovation. I think Bitcoin is really interesting, has some interesting properties, some unique properties and some nice characteristics. But we have to be aware that it's also part of this group right here. That's not necessarily something bad, but it is a fact. Yeah, and that's really it. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with that cliffhanger. Uh, stay curious. See you soon.